Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we again open the word of the Lord, shall we seek his guidance so that we may more fu fully understand that which we are reading and look for its application for our time today. Shall we pray? Yeah. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity we have to gather again together. We thank you for this time of study, for these blessings that you are providing, for your watch care and for your guidance. Direct us today. May our minds be open to receive that which you would have us to consider. May we come to understand that which you are providing from the past as to how it relates to us today. We pray, Father, that our minds may be open. We ask, Father, for your blessing upon those that are attending we seek, Father, your guidance, for there are many things that we each need, spoken and unspoken, that you know of. We know, Father, that you know our needs before we even ask for them, and that you will guide us and direct us in the path that we should follow. Help us to have the faith that we need. Guide us now, direct us, we ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Where we left off yesterday, we are here in Judges 5, verse 6. Now, there were some points that I was looking at here that I felt were interesting. And as you were addressing Theodore, there's some things that you felt were interesting in the portion yet, in the verse yet to come. Mm -hmm. Now, as I'm looking at this, in the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied. And the walkers of paths walked through crooked ways. Why were the highways unoccupied? As we're looking at this, the commentary yesterday in the conversation was that it was because that people were having to choose alternate ways because of issues on the highways themselves. What do we think of when we think of a highway? Literally, what do we think of in, in today's world? What do we think of? Well, it's where your main, main lines of, of transportation occur. Okay. Like Are the they generally well-maintained? Yep. Are they generally well lighted? Are they generally what? Well lighted. Uh, yes. Well, it depends where you are, but. Okay. Uh, Canada doesn't have them well lighted, but they are in the States. Okay. Today, let's, uh, let us consider this in a figurative application. In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, and the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied. What if figuratively the highways are referring to the method of study of the Bible laid out for us by Father Miller's rules.
would that it's, that would make sense i mean well this would um this definitely would make sense then when we're looking at this the walkers of the paths we look to god to guide our paths if these walkers of the paths walk through crooked ways if their method of study is not according to what god has ordained would those not be crooked ways yeah yeah so in hebrew here it says um because you don't notice some things because when they have the word unoccupied there yes it's actually the same word that is is translated as ceased in verse seven, which occurs twice in verse seven. Okay. Um, so literally, it says. Um, and that's kind of odd too. Um, anyway, in the season of Shamgar. Um, So is is how that verse starts out in the days of the son of Anath. Um and the days of Jael, Jael, and then it says, ceased the highways uh from walking. And um the path um was walked and that these would be well, that's an interesting okay so the basically the caravans went through crooked ways they have their travelers walkers of paths but it's it's the idea is caravans The reason that, that I'm asking this in a figurative sense, mm -hmm. each of us are a walker on a path. Yeah. Now, we have paths to choose. We can walk on the path that God has established, or we can walk on the path that man has established. Yeah. Yeah, because the highways would be because they have ceased. So a method of study has ceased. And another method of study has taken over, which is described as crooked, crooked ways. Right. Now, when I'm looking at this and I'm then applying the verses that the translators compared this with. It brings me back to Leviticus 26, verse 22. Now, when we're looking and considering this, in this particular section, Moses said to the children of Israel, I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children and destroy your cattle and make you few in number and your highways will be desolate. But high is a supplied word. Yeah, it's just your ways. So if our ways are desolate, if our method of study is desolate, we are finding that we are that wild beasts are among us those that choose not to study according to miller's rules it removes from us our children because our children do not understand the the method of study that's being used our cattle our spiritual food is being destroyed and right now 
within this movement, we are few in number. So we are seeing the results that Moses warned about. Mm -hmm. We're having to address this figuratively because this is the position that we're taking, that this is not a literal representation for us. This song is giving us a prophetic interpretation. Yeah, and, and that whole word there that's translated as um, well, crooked ways yeah, by the people who put together the notes there, um, the byways in the King James. Uh, this word means winding, devious, crooked um, from the a primitive root to rest in the sense of W-R-E-S-T or to twist, right? Right. Um, implying wrong. So, I mean, this definitely would describe the methods of study that were abandoned and the type that were then taken up. Exactly. Now, the other verses that were being applied here, we have Second Chronicles 1, 5, verse 5. And in those times, there was no peace to him that went out, nor to him that came in. But great vexations were upon all the inhabitants of the countries. We have seen no peace from those that choose to study in the crooked ways. Until we make the decision to study according to Miller's rules, we will not understand what peace is about. So therefore we will not K-N-O-W know peace. Isaiah 33, verse 8. The highways lie waste. The wayfaring man ceaseth. He hath broken the covenant. He hath despised the cities. He regardeth no man. What is Isaiah saying to us here? In relation to what we're reading in the book of Judges. The portion that struck me the hardest is that he hath broken the covenant. If we are not willing to study according to Miller's rules, does this mean we are breaking the covenant with God? How are we to approach this? Well, there's definitely a covenant. In, in order to understand truth, we've been given uh, the charts. We've been given Miller's rules. We've been given the light of the midnight cry. And so it is the understanding of truth is a covenant relationship. Okay. Now, as you were pointing out, in these two verses that we're going to be beginning with the examination today, we have Sitha, Sitha. Mm -hmm. Is that the same word in Isaiah as we're finding in the book of Judges? No. Okay. No, this is more the word uh, related to the word Sabbath. Okay. So it means to, you know, to stop doing something. And then also, um, when you look at the word, um, uh, where is it here? I was just looking at it. 
Okay, yeah, it's yeah, it's this this word itself seizeth there in thirty three eight. The idea is to desist from exertion, right? So that's that's the meaning of it. Okay. Lamentations 1 verse 4. The ways of Zion do mourn because none come to the solemn feasts. All her gates are desolate, her priests sigh, her virgins are afflicted, and she is in bitterness. They combine that with Lamentations 4 verse 18. They hunt our steps that we cannot go in our streets. Our end is near, our days are fulfilled, for our end has come. Directly, I'm having to, having to consider if what we're seeing here in this portion that the highways were unoccupied, the walkers of paths walked through crooked ways. If this is not very directly pointing right to the time of the end. Okay, in the chat, references are given to Isaiah 57, 13 to 21 and Acts 20, 28 to 31. What are you seeing here? I can read it to you if you want. It's uh, Acts 13, 28 to 31. It says, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the flock, the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. So he's thinking of Jeff on his retirement, right? Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, there must be some significance in those three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And in Isaiah 57, 13 on down, when thou criest, let thy companies deliver thee, but the wind shall carry them all away. Vanity shall take them, but he that putteth his trust in me shall possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountain. And shall say, cast ye up, cast ye up, prepare the way, take up the stumbling block out of the way of my people. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. For I will not contend forever, neither will I be always wroth. For the spirit should fail before me and the souls which I have made. For the iniquity of his covetousness was I wroth and smote him. I hid me, I was wroth. And he went on forwardly in the way of his heart. I have seen his ways and will heal him. I will lead him also and restore comforts unto him and to his mourners. I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to him that is far off. And to him that is near, saith the Lord, and I will heal him. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Okay. How would you see this relating to the method of study? Well, we all have a choice as to which way we're going to go. We can put our own interpretation or misinterpretation on the word and our, uh, like have cafeteria style study and application. 
or we can just go for the straight word of God as sometimes incomprehensible as it may seem and just say, Lord, clarify things, lead me on step by step, day by day. Now, this, these passages seem to indicate that there's some hope for those very wicked wayward ones. I was among the very wicked wayward ones most of my life. And look at the mercy that the Lord has had on me. It gives me tremendous faith for the penitent. But I have absolutely no more tolerant tolerance for those who know better and choose to do evil. And not only that, what's even worse, leading others astray with them. This is what really grieves my heart. Okay. Thank you for that. Now, Judges 9, verse, or 5, verse 7. The inhabitants of the villages ceased. They ceased in Israel. Until that I, Deborah, arose, that I arose a mother in Israel. Are we not seeing two doublings here? Yeah, well, ceased and ceased and arose and arose. Now, what you were saying here is that <clears throat> the words in this verse of ceased are the same as the one that's translated unoccupied in the prior verse, right? Yeah. Now here it says the villages ceased, um, but you know the word means uh, like the magistrates. Um, so it can refer uh, to the village in the sense of something that's under a magistrate. Um, but most commonly the idea is the leadership, but the King James translates it as a village. The root of the word means to make decisions, right? So, to decide. Okay. So how could we apply this verse figuratively? I mean, well, I think the idea is that you have the leadership has not done its work. Because it's idle, right? This word means the, um, to desist, be lacking or idle, to be flabby. You know, whenever whenever we bring up something like flabby, I, I start to think of um, the high priest at the time of Samuel. Yeah. Well, I just think of people whose muscles haven't been used. They sort of uh, um, atrophied. In other words, like a soldier that uh, that is not used to battle. Yeah. Okay. So is this then describing both the church and the movement? <clears throat> well, it is, but uh, I mean, we're mostly applying this to the movement here. Okay. And then we have that I, Deborah, arose. Yeah, that I arose. So she's got these two aroses, which is the word kum. So what's the significance of kum? Um, well, it's it means for something to arise, it's um, uh, let me see here. Uh, 
To rise, arise, stand, rise up, stand up. Um, to maintain oneself, to be established, confirmed, fixed, valid, proven, fulfilled, persist. To fulfill or confirm, ratify, establish. Um, and in this case, it would be to raise oneself up to arise. So did Deborah, did she raise herself up in this? Um, well, that's what it says. Um, I'm just looking here. I got to look at this word a bit more closely. Um, so. Yeah, so she says, I arose. So it says in Hebrew. She says, um, I arose. I Deborah arose. Among the people, among the people of Israel, or in Israel. I don't. What are you asking exactly? Well, did Deborah raise herself up, or was she raised up by God? Well, she and was. She was raised up by God. But this form of this word shows that she arose. She stood up. It doesn't say somebody else caused her to stand up. Okay. Right. Just, just the form of the word is she raised herself up. That's all I'm saying. So. Now, why is the first one given from what I'm seeing with a preparational prefix I don't know what you mean okay where it says that I Deborah arose I'm here again I'm I'm using esort yeah and they're trying to say that the first arose as a preparational prefix before kum Um, well, it has uh, a shin in front of it. Right. Sh shakum uh, T. Shakum T. So this says that she she herself rose up. I don't know. Not sure what, 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 what do you think that means? The, well, or, so the prefix. As a preposition that's following, that has a pronoun that follows it. What would, could, that mean? what would that mean then to you? So that I don't understand. That Deborah arose on account of. 
Oh, okay. It means until that. Right. Right. That's what you're talking about. That's what I'm speaking about. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. So you have uh, the word ad. So that's what you're talking about. So, so it just means that she, uh, that basically until, uh, and when she arose, then that changed things. Right. right. So she became a leader. So until, are, are we looking at this, that until the movement began to accept what Mrs. White has written, mm -hmm. that it was, it was very much wandering? Well, okay. So the way that I would look at this is that this has to do with a message, the spirit of prophecy. So when did the spirit of prophecy arise in the context of this movement? Like we might say that happened in 1989. But wouldn't that really be 9-11? I was going to ask if it was 9-11 or if it was after 9-11, such as when we began to understand again the seven times of Leviticus 25 and 26. Okay, maybe maybe that that could apply. If there just becomes a point to me that there's sort of a vindication of the spirit of prophecy, a look into the spirit of prophecy, an understanding of the spirit of prophecy, especially as it relates to chronology because that's the message that's going to be counteracting uh, Parminder's movement. Okay. And so that she arose a mother in Israel. Mm-hmm. A mother gives the has the implication, the visual implication of a woman with children. Yeah, but the word can also mean a port, point of departure or division. The word for mother? Yeah. Okay. Brown Drivers Briggs, they have two different definitions. It means mother of humans, of Deborah's relationship to the people figuratively of animals and the second definition is a point of departure or division well i'm asking in a figurative sense because as deborah was being seen here as a mother in israel mm -hmm. if we're looking at this figuratively is this not a church that is willing to follow the lead that is being given well it's possible i just think that we could apply it to 2014 to the division that happened in the movement which okay. is okay where we're placing this i mean obviously you know you would probably translate it as i arose a mother in israel just based upon the context Okay. But there's a division that happens over the spirit of prophecy. Now, how, how are we going to use the spirit of prophecy? I think is part of the difference between Jeff and Jamal's group. It's interesting too because the the differences, especially when you start breaking it down. When you consider the way that Emiliano was handling things. Mm -hmm. Now, we've, we've spoken in the past of how when he came back from India, he came to Arkansas. He was ill. He was in the, a little trailer. But he came with the understanding of Ezra 7-9, right? 
Yep. But it's intriguing to me that here, here he is now. He has nothing to do with the Sabbath. He believes that Ellen White was a false prophet. He left his wife, hid their children from her. And is either looking to or has already remarried. He's set aside everything that the movement itself has stood for. Well, that's because people don't have a foundation. Well, how in, in this situation, here was a man that was very much a bright and shining star for a small amount of time. Mm -hmm. So oh, I just, yeah, the thing that I see is, you know, people don't realize how little they know. Right. That is, a person can appear in this movement to know lots because they can know some things, you know, and, and maybe even sensational type of things. They can know some details. And, and yet it's, it's a, long, a long experience that a person needs to, to learn their dependence upon God, to recognize how little they know, and and to not trust self but people will put their own ideas above the bible and the spirit of prophecy so what happened in this movement however we want to place this specifically um we know that the leadership ceased it was flabby they ceased in Israel until Deborah arises. And she arose a mother in Israel, whatever that particularly means. But it would have to refer to a change that happened in the movement. Right. And like the next verse says, they chose new gods. Then was war in the gates. Was there a shield or spear seen among 40,000 in Israel? So that's an interesting verse as well in this context. Right. By choosing new gods, does this mean that they, they have chosen different methods of study? War in the gates disagreement mm -hmm. regarding biblical interpretation yeah was there a shield or spear seen why why would we be looking for a shield or a spear and what's the the significance for the 40,000 mm -hmm. So why is why is 40,000 now coming up in the song of Deborah and Barak? I have no idea at this point. Okay. Now here again the translators would have taken us to Deuteronomy 32:16. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods and with abominations provoked they him to anger. And then we have Judges 2.12 and 2.17. And they forsook 
the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. We've already made the application of Judges 2.12 having a symbolic reference back to 2012. Mm -hmm. And Judges 2.17 again for 2017 yeah and yet they would not hearken unto their judges but they went a whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them that they turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in obeying the commandments of the lord but they did not so mm -hmm. yeah and so those apply to those years and and to Parminder. Now, um, and just the Young's literal translation of these verses, verses yeah. 7 and 8, um, and well, 7, 8, 9 of Judges 5. The rulers ceased in Israel, they ceased until thou didst arise, Deborah, that thou didst arise a mother in Israel. Uh, so this one's interesting how he doesn't say, I, Deborah, arose. He's got Deborah, um, which... I just think it's kind of weird because it seems to me that it is in the first person. But anyway, they chose new gods. Then was war in the gates. Was there a shield or a spear seen among 40,000 in Israel? No, actually, this isn't, this isn't Young's uh, literal translation. This is the Jewish Publication Society. Uh, I was looking at Young's and then I switched to this one. Okay. Um, Right, so so the Jewish Publication Society puts rulers in here. Okay. Why do you see that as significant? Well, because that's the word instead of villages, right? All right. Um, and then they, was there a shield or a spear? So so basically. The rulers, that is the people who were leading out, they choose new gods. And, and this becomes Parminder. He definitely chose a new god. Okay, that'd be correct. I agree. Yeah. And then war in the gates. Well, that's definitely what we see that happened in the movement. Now, the 40,000 in Israel, that's a question because it's a rhetorical question. Was there a shield or spear seen among the 40,000 in Israel? And as the translators uh, deal with that, I mean, there's no smith in Israel. Right, so neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan. So this would be, I think referring to because that's a later time but just referring to the idea that they don't have uh, an ability to make these things or you know whether how that's to be understood but the 40,000 I don't know what that would mean how we would apply that all right how many exactly did uh, did Barak call from the two tribes? Well, 10,000. So this is four times that. Could this be representative of the four messages of Revelation 14 and the other angel of Revelation 18? Hmm. I don't know. I... Okay. So, as to the spear and the shield, 
Now there was no smith found throughout the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, let not the Hebrews make them swords or spears. Uh, it's interesting if you divide 40,000 yes. by 60. Okay. Our prophetic year. You get 111.1111, etc. Okay. And we know 111 represents uh, January 11th which is the end of the Levitical chiasm. So it's tied to the September 7th date uh, as well, 2019, because that's going to be 126 days later is January 11th. And we have a January 11th with 2023 as well. What do you see the significance being there? Well, the way that I've understood it is that um, the message of of Collins, Collins' prediction is tied to uh, this. So the chronology is correct, but um, it's also tied to a rejection of the message. So, but it's just an interesting number, 111.1111. So it's just ones all the way through. You just wouldn't expect that when you just look at the numbers themselves. Right. <laughs> that you're going to get that kind of a, a decimal. Okay. But, you know, my argument is that, that 2023, January 11th, marks the end of, um, you know, that's going to be the first day of the 10th month. That's going to be the period in when when the, the divorce begins from Ezra, chapter, chapter 10. Um, You know, according to the law, this divorce that happens according to the law. Right. So anyway, that's the only thing I can see with 40,000 at this point. So... Spiritually, what would we see as being a shield or a spear? In a figurative representation, what, what should we see here? It reminds me of Ephesians 6, where, which is about the, the armor of God. It includes a shield, and I believe it's that there's now the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the shield yeah. of faith, and so on. Yeah, it doesn't have a spear there, but but still does have a shield. The shield's a defensive weapon, the spear is an offensive weapon. Okay. My heart is, is toward the governors of Israel that offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless ye the Lord. Why would this song make this kind of a statement? What symbolically can we address here? Are the governors of Israel the princes? 
Are they the leaders of the people that offer themselves willingly among the people? Now the next verse, 510, speak ye, or in the alternate, meditate, ye that ride on white asses, ye that sit in judgment and that walk by the way. What is so important about those that ride upon the white ass? Now, white is seen as a symbol of purity. But why would this be necessary for them to ride on white asses as a pure symbol of Islam. Are they the ones that are sitting in judgment? Are they the ones that are walking in the right path? What can we see here? Did Jewish royalty ride on white asses? I don't know. Was that was that the the ass that David rode on? I and Christ, that. like, yeah. And I was wondering if Christ came, came into the city riding on a white ass. Maybe it's in the spirit of prophecy somewhere. I know that he came in riding on the cult of an ass. I don't know that the, the Gospels say anything about Christ riding on a white ass. No. There's something here for us to consider, but what is it? I mean, as I see this, this is the only verse of the Old Testament that uses Hebrews 6715 as the definition of white. We find this in the Song of Songs, we find this in several other places, but we don't find we don't find this word being used anywhere else. I mean, it's supposed to be the same as Hebrews 67, 13. And my, my question here too, is the word that's being used for asses, is this in the male or is this in the female? What gender is being used here? Okay, so. Yeah, 6713 in my strong says from an unused root, meaning to dazzle, sheen, that is whiteness. Okay. Yeah, this is a female donkey um, yeah 
Yeah, so the color is actually orange brown or yellowish brown, not white. Okay. Because the Hebrew word means tawny or amber. Okay. Or it's you know it's 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 a so it's a light yellowish brown. So it's. So the word is actually yellowish brown, but the, the King James translators placed it as white. Yeah. It'd be like a lion's coat is a tawny color. Right. Or but why, why would they look to, to use white here, especially in relation to this with the ass? Well, I think it has to do with the word, meaning of the word white. Okay. Because white can just mean light. A light. Um, So it can mean pale. Was it possible that they had been comparing some of this with what we would find in the book of Revelation? Um, I don't think so. I just think they chose the word white because it's a light colored ass. Okay. So why would they be told to meditate, ye that ride on white asses? Are we being given three different groups? Ye that ride on white asses, ye that sit in judgment, and ye that walk by the way. No, it's two groups. Okay. Why do you see it as two? Because there's only two yees. Okay. It's two different groups. Okay. And, and it's and it's a parallelism. Okay. Um, so the word here, the reason why they use the word speak, is because these are ones that sit in judgment, right? So they're going to declare the sentence. So they're going to meditate upon it, right? They're going to consider. And... So I, I think the idea here, the contrast, because um, there are some that ride and some that walk, by the way. Um, so, but it's a parallelism, but it's contrasting two different groups. Okay. Not the same group. So is this is this contrasting the two classes? Yeah, that's what I think. So we would have one class that ride upon the white asses and one class that sit in judgment and walk by the way. Yeah, and this word judgment it, yes. It's not usually the word that you would see as judgment. Okay. Um, so it um, usually refers to a cloth or a garment or measure. It means to stretch, figuratively, figuratively to be extended, measure, meet off, stretch, self. Um, So it's kind of an odd um, 
I mean, you could have said those that sit on the carpet, <laughs> but I, I don't know if that would be the best way to translate it. Now, um, the Jewish Publication Society, it does put it into three groups. Um, ye that ride on white asses, ye that sit on rich cloths, and ye that walk by the way, tell of it. Um, so it's just telling three different groups who should speak of it. But I, I don't think that makes sense from what I can see in the Hebrew. Are there any other applications we could make figuratively to this passage? Well, what about the asses having to do with Islam? Well, if the second group that sit in judgment and walk by the way are walking a in the paths that God has ordained, then those that are on the white asses would need to be the other class, right? I don't put those that sit in judgment as the right class. Okay, that's why I'm comparing this. Yeah. So this sitting in judgment to me is not correct. Like it's, so, not, a, it's not a true judgment. So in other words, they these are those that are sitting in the space in, in the seat of judgment mm -hmm. but are walking in the wrong paths. Yeah. yeah. This is a this is weird in the Hebrew here. So um yeah, I don't know. It's hard to okay, so first off. It talk, talks about those riding on asses um, that are tawny, right? So literally in Hebrew, it says uh, rakab, which means ride. Uh, and, um, and then athon, which is a female ass. And then tawny, uh, tsakor, which means tawny. So... I mean, it can mean white, but it just means white in the sense of light. So, I mean, I guess we could be tawny, right? In that sense, that type of white. We're not like a pure white color, our skin, at least. And then, um, and then it says, Yashab, sit down. Uh, has the prefix then, and then this word, uh, on a on a carpet, so also referring to a carpet that is a height, also a measure by implication vesture, which means it's translated in the King James as armor, clothes, garment, judgment, measure, raiment, stature. So, so this would be referring to a class of people, and and then it says uh, walk. Um, the road and ponder. So that's what it says in Hebrew. That's the order of the words. So it doesn't put the ponder at the beginning. So it just talks about those that ride on white asses that sit on on this carpet and that walk and and meditate. So here it doesn't seem to be at all in the Hebrew. Uh, the way that we see it here in the King James. So it could be speaking just of one class. Or it could be speaking of different classes and asking them all to ponder. So, I don't know, it's, it's a rather difficult sentence.
You got any thoughts on that, Dwight? Or? I'm just what, I, what I'm trying to consider with this is how the spiritual application itself would work for our time. Yeah. Well, part of the problem is it's a poem. And so, really? yeah, so it's written in a poetic way, which is why the sentences are, are hard to translate. Um, so, So what if there's three different groups, like you said, but all of those groups are supposed to ponder? Right. But it's a – okay, so that might make sense. So the translator's way of looking at it, meditate, ye that ride on white asses, ye that sit in judgment, and, and ye that walk by the way, if you put it that way. But it's not, it's not separate classes that represent different um, – like a saved or a lost class. It's just – telling everyone to consider this because there's different groups of people. Right. Okay. That would make sense. So now as we continue with this, these are to meditate to consider carefully that's that's what i take away from meditate yeah yeah that's what's being asked to consider things so we have to consider what's being said and now when we come down to the next verse they that are delivered from the noise of archers in the places of drawing water there shall they rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord or the righteousness of the Lord, even the righteous acts toward the inhabitants of his villages in Israel. Then shall the people of the Lord go down to the gates. Now we've established from our study in Esther, we've established from looking at, at the examples in the book of Ruth, that the city gates are where the major decisions were being made, right? Isn't that where judgment was being addressed? Mm -hmm. Why is it important for us to note for of those that are delivered from the noise of archers in the places of drawing water. I mean, drawing the water would mean a well. What is, yeah. the, what's the noise of the archers? Yeah, well, here I have louder than the voice of archers by the watering troughs. Okay. Is that Jewish publication or Young's yeah, Little? That's the Jewish Publication Society. Okay. And that, that seems to accord with what I see in the Hebrew. I mean, they have this added part, they that are delivered, which, of course, there is no uh, sense of that in the Hebrew. Okay. There they shall rehearse the righteousness of the Lord, even the righteous acts toward the inhabitants of his villages in Israel. Are we not told to praise God in all things? 
when something good happens for us or something that we don't think is good? Are we not to yet praise God? Mm -hmm. Man, this doesn't make any sense. These are hard sentences to translate. Sure. But are we not told to wrestle with the word of God? How can we become better? How can we understand more fully that which is being presented at this time unless we go in and we find situations verses like this that are hard that are hard sayings yeah but anyway you got the noise of the archers in the places of drawing water right not they're not delivered from the noise of the archers and this idea of noise is to call out so they call out it's a loud voice or sound right so it's kind of like a loud cry but it's of the archers and we have applied the archers to to islam all right right And then we have to rehearse the righteous acts. Well, wouldn't that be drawing things line upon line? I would say so. That's a good possibility. Yeah. Because how else can we show what the the leading and the providence of our of our heavenly Father? Mm-hmm. Especially the righteous acts towards the inhabitants of his villages. Yeah, well, that would be the leaders. Um, Again, that's rulers or leaders. And and they have towards the inhabitants of the villages. Uh, Doesn't make sense. Well, again, just the rights of acts of his rulers in Israel. It's not towards his rulers in Israel. Here again, supplied words. Yeah, but they're trying to make the sentence make sense. And they're just not making it make sense. So they got Sham, which is there. Yeah, you have to recount or rehearse the righteousness. Lord, right doing of the leaders in Israel. Yeah, so the King James doesn't make sense here with these added words. Because these are the righteous acts of the rulers in Israel. And then it says, then shall the people go down to the gates. All right. So. Now, wow, that's weird. Just so strange how the King James translates things sometimes. Um. Okay, so I don't even get any of this. Sometimes I think I'm looking at like a completely different sentence or something. Um, So we go through here. Okay. 
see if this makes sense. I know that the, you know, the cross reference that was given by the translators would have begun with First Samuel twelve seven, and if you reverse that, of course, you wind up with seven twenty one. Now therefore, stand still, that I may reason with you before the Lord of all the righteous acts of the Lord which he did to you and to your fathers. So this portion of 1 Samuel is interesting. Because that's, that's part of Samuel's address to the people after they have made it clear that they want a king. Uh -huh. So he's reminding them of how their unseen king, how the ruler of the universe had been so kind and had led their fathers and led them in so many different ways. And they were rejecting him, not Samuel, they were rejecting God. Isn't that the same thing that's been occurring in choosing to set aside Miller's rules? Yeah, I see your point there, Dwight, pretty clearly. And also, the people would go down to the gates. They'd convene there for judgment, for making deals, you know, I guess to see the king parade back and forth. So it's, it's a meeting place. Well, as we understood this, in a situation with Mordecai, as we understood this with Boaz. The major decisions would be made at the gates of the city. This is why the, the chapters at the end of the book of Judges have intrigued me so much because you've got this Levite of Judah that comes with his concubine and comes to the gates of the city and is then taken by another another party from his home area to go to their abode. Now the translators are providing that they are delivered from the noise of archers in the places of drawing water. I'm intrigued about this on the noise of archers. So how else could this be looked at? I mean, well, as I've long believed and I've long said, I believe there'd be a lot of Muslim people coming and coming to know the Lord, even coming into this movement, because some of them are actually looking for a merciful God, a truly merciful God. And they're looking for the truth. I mean, I've met some of them. They had so much respect for Christ. I mean, even the Christ they did not know. When I was praying in the name of Jesus, and they saw the prayers fulfilled right away, they were astonished. And when I was showing them some of the books I was carrying, there was so much respect. They literally went out of their way to convenience me. And I never asked them to. So I have hope for a lot of these people. 
it was humbling to be among them. All right. But the noise of the archers. Should Lamentations 5 verse 4 be applied here? Because as Jeremiah wrote, we have drunken our water for money. Our wood is sold unto us. And then a little bit later in Lamentations 5, 9, we get our bread with the peril of our lives because of the sword of the wilderness. Now, that's what more currently is being applied here. That's not what the translators of the King James were applying. I mean, when I'm looking at this, according to the, the, the Hebrew, we would look at, at the noise being mini coal. Coal is voice. Right. But is this a, another loud cry? Yeah, that's kind of what I think. Because is this a loud cry at the well of the living water? Yeah, and this is just a hard thing to translate. Everybody translates it differently. Okay. Um, So the sense here that we have is that the voice, this loud voice, this voice is of the dividers between the watering places, a division. And there they shall tell again the righteous acts of Jehovah, the righteous acts of his leaders in Israel. Then shall the people of Israel go down to the gates. which the gates is where you uh, meet people. All right. Now, we're coming toward the end of our time today. Should we return to this verse tomorrow and see if we can make any more sense of it through the day today? Yeah. Are there other thoughts or other comments in regard to these, these passages that we have been addressing? Well, it just seems that we have um, a message that is di dividing two groups. And it's connected to the midnight cry or the loud cry. Okay. Can we, can, do you think with a little bit of time, we might be able to show that? in relation to these passages. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other comments? All right. Shall we then close with prayer? Okay. Yeah. Gracious Father in heaven, we do not yet understand fully the passages that are before us. We thank you for this time today. 
We thank you for this opportunity we've had to study together. We ask you now, Father, to be with us, to bring us again together again tomorrow. Help us that we may understand these passages so that we might more clearly understand that which you are trying to tell us. Be with us each one today, and in all things, guide us and direct us. For this we thank you, for this we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.